Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome, everyone, to Panania Anglican Church on a beautiful, sunny morning. And good morning to you, too, if you're watching from home. Of course, after church, there's going to be a mad scramble as uh, people who are involved in Guess Who's Coming to Lunch or either as hosts going off to make sure the, the houses are all spick and span or uh, all the guests making sure that they uh, have all the things that they have to take. But of course, we'll all be joining in a meal together today as we meet around the Lord's table for the Lord's Supper. So if you didn't um, already get one of your little packs on the way in, make sure you uh, pick one up before we come to that part of our service. Um, what I thought I'd do today is I'd just borrow a bit from our traditional service that we have once a month for communion. And um, if we could all pray this prayer together as we come together and focus on worshipping our great God. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus, Lord. Amen. Okay, so if you'd all stand for our first couple of songs.
sing Jesus Strong and Kind. privilege to be gathering here with you, God's people, on a Sunday. You're very welcome, especially if you're here for the first time. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you find uh, some great fellowship here this morning. Uh, If it is your first time, there's a little card at the end of your seat you could fill out and pop in one of the white boxes at the doors to let us know you are here, or you could use your phone for the QR code that's out in the entryway. My name's John. I'm on the staff team here. I've got a couple of things to let you know about. Uh, Firstly, it's Vietnam Veterans Day today uh, in honour of the Battle of 
long tan. Uh, and after the service today, you may know that our brother John, who was uh, in Vietnam uh, on our behalf, uh, he has a little service. There's prayer. Uh, it's a wonderful little gathering. Uh, and he's doing one today for Vietnam Veterans Day at 11 o'clock down at the bottom of Lambeth Street, 191, I think. And you're very welcome to head down there uh, and join John for that. But many of us as well, from 12 or 12.30, whatever time you've seen in your emails, will be going to lunch with each other. I believe there's more than 90 people having lunches at each other's houses today. I would love that to be every Sunday, but this is a great start in that direction. So uh, you're, you're, hopefully you've, you've found out where you're going. But if there's any doubt, I'm sure Jackie can help you out. Jackie's going to wave. Oh, sorry, Jackie's at the front. There you go. Uh, you could always come and see Jackie if there's any confusion. And you know what? No one's stopping you organising something on the spot. So if you haven't gotten onto this lunch thing today, you could just look around you and say, what are you doing for lunch? And go and grab lunch with someone. You could do that as well. You're very welcome to. Uh, lastly, next Sunday, I just want to let you know, next Sunday, there's, there's both a, a happy and a sad dimension to it next Sunday. Uh, we'll be baptising Archie Sartor here, which will be lovely, uh, but we'll also be saying farewell to Paul and Julie Curtis, because they're moving to Canberra, and that has come uh, sooner than they were expecting, but God has provided a place for them, and their family are down there, so we'll be praying uh, in thankfulness for them next week as well. So two great reasons uh, to make sure you're here next week as well. Well, our little ones are going to head out for their kids' programs. If you've got kids here for the first time, just look for one of the leaders in the entryway. They'll help you know where the different groups go. Uh, and then we'll continue with our service in a moment. Well, as the kids go out, let's come to God in prayer this morning. Join with me. Lord, we begin today by pausing to turn our minds to you, to see your perspective, to focus on your goodness, and to bring our thoughts out of the limitations of our world to the one and only Saviour God. We come to you, the true shepherd and king, reflecting on Psalm 23. The Lord is our shepherd. We lack nothing. You make us lie down in green pastures, leading us beside quiet waters. You refresh our souls, guiding us along the right paths for your name's sake. Help us follow your guidance and listen to you as our shepherd. Thank you for bringing your people here together this morning. We give you thanks for our community and the way you're developing us into wiser, loving and selfless people. Thank you for teaching us this term from the book of Jeremiah. May we heed the warnings, repent, learn of your unfathomable and unwavering faithfulness in the face of terrible sin and rebellion. Help us recognise how you want us to live in justice and righteousness, to turn from our selfishness and to cling to the hope of your promises, regardless of what we see in the world. As we bring our church fellowship to you, we seek your help to grow in pastoral skills and love for one another. Please help us to be aware of others, not seeking our own good, but that of all. We pray especially for the sick or those who cannot get to church. Loving Father, please bless them with your presence and care. Thank you for those who can participate in the on service online and help us to continue connecting with them. For our partner churches, Lord, be with Greenacre Church and Living Waters Church. Help them bring, build bridges with their local community for God's glory and for the leaders to be shepherds of their flock and eager, eager to serve. Lord, we pray for the SRE teachers, especially in our area, Lord, as they preach the gospel to children each week. Thank you that some children are coming to other church activities and to Sunday church with their families. We pray that schools in our region and throughout the state will be receptive and helpful to the SRE classes. We pray for our leaders here at Panania, Lord, for John, Nigel, Jackie. Guide them and keep them faithful in looking, for, looking to you. Lord, we especially pray for Brendan as he and his family look to the future. Please secure them in your care and guide them in their decisions. And for all the leaders in our church here, Lord, Help us to be shepherds um, for each ministry in our church here. Please help them to be diligent, humble, 
as they guide your people. God of all the earth, we come before you with heavy hearts as we see conflicts and suffering around the globe. Only you can bring true peace. In your mercy, please limit the pain, distress and displacement of war and help world leaders to govern fairly for the benefit of their people. We also bring before you those affected by natural disasters, such, such as the devastating lands, landslide in PNG a few months ago where towns are still isolated. Please be with the many who have lost loved ones and allow access for medical teams and those bringing aid to the community as the community rebuilds. Heavenly Father, as we commemorate Vietnam, Vietnam Veterans Day on the anniversary of the Battle of Long Tan in 1966, we thank you so much, Lord, for their service and sacrifice. Lord, we pray that you would be with them until your world is perfected in peace through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Okay. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. It's time to worship our great God in song again. As we consider what a great shepherd he is in supplying all our needs. Please stand.
first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 to 8, and then verses 25 to 40, and that's found on page 773 in the blue, blue Bibles in the pews. That's Jeremiah 23, beginning at the first verse. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. So then, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he had banished them. Then they will live in their own land. And moving down to verse 25. I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their fathers forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another words supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare, the Lord declares. Indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies, yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. When these people or a prophet or a priest ask you, what is the oracle of the Lord? Say to them, what oracle? I will forsake you, declares the Lord. If a prophet or a priest or anyone else claims, this is the oracle of the Lord, I will punish that man and his household. This is what each of you keeps on saying to his friend or relative. What is the Lord's answer? Or what has the Lord spoken? But you must not mention the oracle of the Lord again, because every man's own word becomes his oracle, and so you distort the words of the living God, the Lord Almighty, our God. This is what you, are, you keep saying to a prophet. What is the Lord's answer to you? Or what has the Lord spoken? Although you claim this is the oracle of the Lord, this is what the Lord says. You use the words, this is the oracle of the Lord, even though I told you that you must not claim this is the oracle of the Lord. Therefore, I will surely forget you and cast you out of my presence along with the city I gave to you and your fathers. I will bring upon you everlasting disgrace, everlasting shame that will not be forgotten. That's the end of the first reading. The New Testament reading is from 1 Peter, chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. To the elders and the flock. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, 
as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Let's pray, friends. Faithful God, you caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. So will you help us so to hear them, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and always hold firmly to the blessed hope of eternal life, which you've given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So you've probably seen this week the fiasco with local council elections. Uh, the Liberal State Secretariat somehow failed to submit over 100 of its candidates to the local council elections. And immediately the question is, who's responsible for this? Who's responsible? It's a big deal, isn't it? Our own local uh, setting, sitting councillor, Sharbal Aberard, was caught up in this, so he's not on the list. You won't see him there on the list in the election, not at his intention. And you say, who's responsible? I'm sure there will be a chain of angry phone calls getting to the bottom of this. In fact, the opposition leader said he'd rung the state director and I'm sure the state director had rung the local secretariat and, and they went down the chain and there's probably some poor overworked schmuck at the bottom somewhere who finds a hundred unsubmitted candidates on their desk buried somewhere. But even if you find that guy, that's not the answer to the question who's responsible completely, is it? Actually, you've got to go up the chain. There's something about those who were in charge. They're in responsible too. Upper management should have hired enough staff. Middle management should have checked with the Electoral Commission. And you've probably seen the State Director, Richard Shields, has already lost his job over it because that's how it works. He's in charge. He carries the responsibility. He's accountable for what happens on his watch. And in the book of Jeremiah so far, we've seen the people of Judah have gone completely off the rails with God. Idolatry, ungodliness, injustice, there's an old Bible illustration of what's going on. And the result is God's pot of judgment up there in the top left is about to tip over. Babylon is coming. And one of the purposes of this book of Jeremiah is who's responsible? How did this happen? Why did God's people go into exile? And it's not enough just to say, well, the people went off track. They each went their own way instead of God's way. That's not the full answer, is it? God doesn't just make the, the angry phone call to the, the average person of Judah in the street. Jeremiah chapter 23 is actually God's phone call to the, the management, the leadership of Israel. So in chapter 23, we're jumping ahead again, God's calling out two different levels of management, we might say. He's going to speak to the kings, we might see them as the CEOs, those in charge of God's people, and that's verses 1 to 8. And then the prophets, I'm calling them the communications directors in Judah. He calls them as well from verses 9 to the end. But for both of them, what God's going to lay out is their failure of leadership and His standard of leadership. Their failure, His standard. Everyone's responsible before God, but this chapter is God's phone call to the leaders in particular. And so we'll, we'll apply this as we go through, we'll apply this to all kinds of Christian leadership, whether in the church or the home, parents are leaders, in Christian organisations, schools, all kinds of situations we'll see. God doesn't just call the, the factory floor to account, He calls management to account as well. But let's start at the top with the CEOs, the kings of Judah. Jeremiah calls them shepherds, verse 23, uh, sorry, chapter 23, verse 1, woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. When he says shepherds, he means kings here, of course. We did in our pastoral care series that, that tracing of the image of leadership as a shepherd through the Bible. 
And it's particularly an image of the king of Israel because the most famous king was King David, the shepherd king. And you can see if you look down to verse 5, that's actually King David we're getting to in this discussion. And if you read back a couple of chapters, Jeremiah's actually been running through all the current kings of Israel and giving them an angry phone call each as well. But the message for the kings is, you're responsible for this, you're responsible for destroying and scattering. How is that? Well, the destroying, the destroying is actually the destroying of their faith. The destroying of their faith. If the people of Judah have drifted into this idolatry and ungodliness and injustice, it's because the leaders have been encouraging idolatry and modelling ungodliness and allowing injustice. Those who are supposed to be leading the sheep away from the cliff have been driving them over the edge. You can imagine that staffer at the, the Liberal Secretariat, the nomination deadline's coming up and perhaps someone, some manager goes over to the, the worker's desk and says, we've got a big fundraiser coming up. Are you on that? Are you organising it? And they say, well, I've got 400 submissions for the election on my desk. And they say, no, no, just, just get on it. There's a failure of leadership. There's someone driving someone towards the wrong priority. Now imagine the church. All kinds of wonderful activities happening. It's a madhouse of ministry. Imagine the, the men's breakfast coordinator rings up the pastor and says, I'm not sure this event we've got coming up, I'm not sure it's actually going to help people love Jesus in any way or help them share Jesus in any way. And imagine the pastor says, but it's on the calendar. We've got to do it. Just make it happen. That's a failure of spiritual leadership, isn't it? Driving someone to the wrong priorities first. And that's destructive for the sheep. But the scattering, the scattering is the damage the sheep bring on themselves by taking on those wrong priorities. The people of Israel are about to go into exile. They'll be scattered all over the ancient Near East from Babylon down to Egypt. And that happens as God's justice. He says, I drive them out. I'm the one who's driving them in discipline on them. But they came under that judgment because no one held them back. Verse 2, no one bestowed care. That's not no one cooked them a meal. That's not no one gave them a lift. That's no one cared enough to call them back. And so they go missing, verse 4 says, MIA. That's a, that's a classic failure of Christian leadership, you realise. When we have a group of people under our care and someone starts to drift in godliness or attendance or priorities, maybe just the, the way they talk starts to shift from the things of God to the things of the world all the time. That's why at our staff meeting each week, you may not know this, we have an MIA meeting at our staff meeting. We say, well, what's, is there anyone who needs a care call right now? Anyone we haven't seen around for a while? Anyone we're concerned about? And anyone can make that kind of call, but the leader must the leader must make sure that call happens. Just want to ask how you're going. You ring them up. Just want to ask how you're going. I haven't seen you around for a while. You're going okay. I've just noticed you, you don't take part in prayer anymore at Bible study. Is everything okay? I've, I've just noticed that, that you, you, you don't seem to be making God a priority anymore in your life. I've just noticed that you don't seem to be in the fight against sin anymore. Anyone can make that call. Plenty of people should make that call, but the leader must. Or else what happens? The sheep scatter. They, they actually continue the drift away from the Lord Jesus. And maybe they experience God's discipline as a result of that. But who is responsible? Not just them. There's a failure of Christian leadership sometimes, at whatever level, whether it, whether it is the leadership in the home, the leadership in the church or ministry or group, the, the leadership of a Christian organisation, a school. It's the job of the leader. In ancient Israel, it was the job of the king. The last good king they had was Josiah. And do you remember what Josiah did? He did it right. He was fixing up the temple. They discovered the book of Moses, the book of the law. They discovered that because they'd lost it. Can you imagine losing the Bible? No one noticed we'd lost the Bible. And so, 
everyone got off track and Josiah said, how could this happen? We need to turn back. He got the whole country together. He literally gathered the whole country to get back on track. Sometimes that's my job around here, to sound the alarm, to give the hard application, to preach the hard sermon. And, it, and it's never <laughs> pleasant, you know. I always get hit from both sides when I do that. Someone says, I haven't gone far enough. Someone says, you've gone too far. But that's part of my responsibility and the role you've given me. Same for the head of a Christian school, Christian department. Why? Because they're not actually your sheep. They're God's sheep. Verse 3 says it, my flock. So we're accountable to Him. We're not accountable for their faith, that is, we can't make them believe, but we are accountable to God for how we bestow care, for the call to bring them back, the call to help them in the right direction. My flock, God says. And verse 2, it's very serious, isn't it? If you didn't bestow care, he says, I'll bestow punishment. That's a very sobering language, isn't it? In the New Testament, it actually says the same. Hebrews 13, I tremble at these verses. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they watch over you as those who must give an account. One day you'll get the phone call from God. And either it'll be a well done, good or faithful servant, or it'll be a how did you let this happen? That's the failure of leadership in Judah. What's God's standard of leadership? Well, verse 3, verse 3, God says, I'll do it myself. You haven't been doing it, I'll do it myself. Where you scattered, I'll bring them back. Where you failed to care, I'll bestow care, I'll lead them to pasture, I'll make them fruitful again. And the way God will do this, he says, is by replacing the bad shepherds with good. And this is the first big note of hope in Jeremiah. You may have got the sense this is a very dark book, times are bad, but there is hope here, especially because God has one particular king in mind, one particular shepherd in mind who he's going to send. Verse 5, I will raise up for David a righteous branch. It's an odd title, a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely. Now, this promise is also in the book of Isaiah, the book of Zechariah. It's a particular image of, in the Old Testament of God's promise of a Messiah. And it's the image of a new sprout coming up, a new branch growing out of what seemed dead. I took a photo when I was uh, doing a bushwalk after the big bushfires, we'll bring it up here. I took a photo of a a tree stump, I thought this reminded me of Jeremiah 23, Uh, a tree stump cut off, there's the kings of Judah, God's about to, to end the kingdom, but something new will sprout unexpectedly from it. That's the promise of the of the Messiah and not just another David, if you look at verse 6, this king will be a saver a saviour. In fact, his name will be the Lord, our righteous saviour. Somehow this king will have God's own name. Because what the failure of leadership in Judah shows us is in the end, no one can live up to God's standard of leadership. Have you felt that? Are you a leader? You've already felt the weight of these verses? Well, here's the hope. God himself will come and do what we could never do. And so the angel says, give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus descended from David, a branch in that royal family tree. And what does he say himself? I am the good shepherd. That's key, I think, if you want to lead God's flock. First, for the hope, yes, there is, there is someone who's empowering what I'm trying to do, but also for the corrective, I'm not Jesus, I'm not the Messiah of this group of people, I'm not the Saviour of this group God's put in charge of me, Jesus is. But there is still a standard of leadership, and that's why we read from 1 Peter chapter 5. Here's the standard, if you're a sub-shepherd, you're under Jesus, 
but you've still been given a certain care. Here's your standard. Watch over them. Watch over them. Don't let them drift off that cliff. And not because you must, because you're eager. You love that you've been given a role for God. Not for dishonest gain, not for the prestige. Isn't my church going well, my ministry going well, my family going well? But because you're eager to serve. How can I bless this group of people in their faith and practice? And as an example to the flock as well, don't, don't model ungodliness, don't model flakiness, don't model idolatry, don't allow injustice. Make the hard call when you need to. Don't leave any candidate for heaven unsubmitted on your desk. Make sure, as verse 4 says, when the day of accountability comes, when the phone call comes, it won't be an angry phone call. Make sure it's this one. When the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Well done. That's God's standard of leadership. And that's the kings, okay? They're like the CEOs, those at the very top. But then comes the prophets, and this is verse 9 to the end. It says, concerning the prophets. But we're going to jump down to verse 25. And the prophets, as I said, are like the communications team. They're supposed to pass on from God communications to the king and the people, even the nations around them. And there's a bunch of these guys. Jeremiah's kind of off to the side as a prophet. He's kind of the, the renegade prophet who God has sent from outside the system because the system's broken. But there is this team. They're part of the king's leadership team, this group of prophets. And once again, Jeremiah tells us there's a failure of leadership, but there is God's standard of leadership. The failure is these prophets confuse their own message with God's message. It's there in verse 25. They say, I had a dream. I had a dream. And that's not Martin Luther King, I have this vision for an improved country. No, this, this is, I have a message from God about what he's doing. Let me tell you what God is doing. But Jeremiah says they're lying about that. They're deluded about that. They're actually distracting people from what God is actually doing. And you want to say, well, at least they're talking about God. At least they're not like the, the prophets of Israel who taught the people to worship Baal. It's actually worse than that because they're fooling the people that this comes from Yahweh, the God of Israel. They claim to be speaking God's word, but they're making it up, verse 36. Each one's word becomes their own message, not God's word. Now, you pause at that point and say, why on earth would anyone do that? Why would they do that? The answer is authority, of course. Authority. It's powerful to speak God's word. People come to you. Verse 33, people came to Jeremiah, tell us the message. Tell us the message. Whatever you say next, people take that seriously as a divine word on their lives. That's a position of power. Maybe you've met people like this who, who love to claim that authority to speak into your life for God. Maybe you've got the inkling, this person, I'm, I'm not sure that is what they're doing. There's a few flags for someone like Jeremiah is speaking to here a few red flags. One is, this kind of person loves to argue, you know, they love to argue. They try to prove the depths of their knowledge, but if you scratch the surface, you often find they have borrowed this wholesale from someone else, and that's what happens here, like verse 30. They steal from each other words, supposedly, from me. People love to find something that sounds like it could be from God, something that sounds attractive. Another red flag is that they're often the lone wolf. Have you met this kind of person? They want to be the authority, so they never want to be under anyone's authority. So they don't go to a church themselves. But they love to invite other Christians to be under their authority. And again, if you scratch the surface, they're often talking the talk, but not walking the walk. Just one example from my experience. I, I know a man, he still sends me emails, uh, who straight out claims he's a prophet. 
He claims that that he's able to interpret world's events from God's perspective and tell us exactly what's happening. And as you might guess, he's right into the end times. He loves reading the book of Revelation. He's got it all mapped out of where we are. He used to tell me, John, do you realise we're we're just after the third horse of the apocalypse? That's where we are in history. It's all encoded there, God's revealed to me where we're up to. I had to say to him, Mate, I'm, I'm, not sh- I'm not sure what you're saying is right. I don't see that the book of Revelation is even there to help us map out a timeline. Jesus says no one knows the times. Isn't the book of Revelation there to assure us Jesus wins in the end? But he loved to, to have that authority of telling people what was going on from God's perspective. In fact, one day he told me, he said, John, I think it's about time that I go on the preaching roster. And I had to say to him, mate, you're not even in a Bible study. Usually the way this works is someone in a Bible study would, would be recognised, oh, they've got some, some helpful ways of understanding God's Word and they're invited to lead a study and if they do that well, then we see what happens next. But he wasn't interested in being in a group. He didn't want to be under anyone else's authority. So here's, here's the failure of leadership in the prophets of Jeremiah's day. The failure is by claiming that God is revealing new things, they're distracting people from what God has already said. That's the problem. By trying to say God's revealing something new, they're distracting people from what God's already reliably said. Verse 33, God says to Jeremiah, if they ask you what's the message from the Lord, say what message? The same message I've been saying all along, judgment, judgment is coming. That's the Lord's message. Nothing's changed. But the people keep coming back asking, what's the message from the Lord? As if they're hoping for a different answer. And sadly, they get it. The prophets in Jeremiah's day, we've already seen, they start prophesying peace. No, there's no disaster coming. That's the failure of leadership. Verse 36, you distort the words of the living God, the Lord Almighty. And so what they're doing is they're they're padding the corners of God's Word. They're softening the edges of the message. Verse 29, God says, my word is fire. My word is is a hammer. It's like Jesus had to say, I haven't come to bring peace, but a sword. You've misunderstood. So there's God's standard of leadership. You want to follow God's standard of leadership? Do a Jeremiah. When people ask, what's the message? You say, the same as it's always been. Repent and believe the good news. Make disciples of all nations. Live a life worthy of the gospel. There's nothing new to be revealed beyond that. And yes, of course, of course, we we have to work out how to live as God's people in the situation we find ourselves. But that message is not going to change, is it? There's nothing new about the situation we find ourselves in as a world. People still need Jesus. I need Jesus. And sure, God can still communicate in dreams and visions any way He wants, of course. The question is not how He can. The question is how does He promise to do it? How should we expect Him to do it? Hebrews 1 says, yes, God has used all kinds of ways through the prophets, dreams and visions, but in these last days, God has spoken to us in His Son, in His Word. Christ is the full stop on the Gospel. We know now what God was always planning to do to save us. So I do want to say this carefully, but I want to say, if you, if you are the person who likes to say, I've had a dream and that's from the Lord, or I've had a special word of knowledge or guidance from the Lord in some supernatural way outside of the Bible, then I want to say, just be very careful to test that against God's Word. Make sure you're not distracting people from what God has already said clearly. Make sure you're not distracting yourself. It's a very serious warning here, isn't it? To claim a message from the Lord. I think we do it very casually sometimes. We we have this Christian vocab that, that kind of suggests God is speaking to us constantly in a way separate from His Word. We need to be very careful in making that claim. I have a message from the Lord especially if you're a leader, because you're the one modelling how people should expect God to speak. God's standard of leadership is, I've already spoken. Make sure you've got that message. 
So friends, in Jeremiah so far, we've heard God's phone call to the people up to this point, but now we've got his phone call to the leaders. And he's called to the kings and the prophets, the CEOs and the comms department, those who lead for God and those who speak for God. And what's he on about in that phone call? The failure of leadership and the standard of leadership. Yes, everyone's responsible for themselves before the Lord, but leaders have been given a special responsibility too. If you're a leader, you're accountable. You're in that chain of accountability, and sooner or later, the phone will be ringing. Let me pray for us. Father, for some of us here, these words weigh very heavy as we carry a responsibility for others that we feel deeply. Please just help us be faithful and rely on the Lord Jesus, who is the good shepherd over us and his ability to change hearts. But we also pray for those of us who speak very casually of a message from the Lord, for those of us who carry the leadership responsibility lightly, that we might take seriously your standard of leadership, Lord, and we might always be pointing people back to what you have told us in the gospel. Amen. Please stand.
Friends, have a seat. Uh, We're going to share in the Lord's Supper, and if you would like to take part, there's this little cup that's in the entryway. It's got a, a top layer with a wafer and a bottom layer with the juice. But the reason we do this is because Jesus commanded us to celebrate his death and the victory won for us at the cross and at the resurrection. And so we're going to eat and drink, but what are we really going on? The real action is here in our hearts as we set our faith in Jesus. I'm going to remind you of a few things the Bible says about this meal, and then we're going to share in it together. But if your trust is in the Lord Jesus, or if you'd like to do that even for the first time this morning, then you're welcome to join us in this meal. The Apostle Paul indicates the significance of eating and drinking in this way. He says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break? a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share that one loaf. He also says, whenever you eat and drink, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But there's also a warning in the Bible about coming too lightly to this meal. Paul says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves, he says, before they eat and drink. And the way we do that here is to say a prayer of confession together, and I invite you to join me in this prayer. Gracious Lord, we are not worthy to eat the crumbs from under your table, but your love compels us to draw near. We come with repentance and faith to express our need for all the benefits of your Son's death for us. Renew us in your service and help us to love one another as members of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let me pray for us. We thank you, our Father, that in your love and mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our salvation, and by this offering of himself once and for all time, he made a full, perfect, sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and commanded us to continue a remembrance of his precious death. Hear us then, merciful Father, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to our Saviour's command, in remembrance of his suffering and death, may be partakers of his body and blood. Amen. You might like to, to take out that wafer as I remind you that on the night before he died, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after, this, after the meal, he took the cup and again giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So do this in remembrance of me, he said. So I invite you then, friends, take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. And I invite you to drink this cup together in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Let me pray again. Loving Father, through faith in your Son and his saving death, our sins are forgiven and we share in the life of his body. So with gratitude for all your mercies, we offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out from here in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Thanks, Brian. Well, this brings us to the end of our formal worship together. But of course, the fellowship continues at morning tea and at lunch and beyond. And I'd just like to finish off now by saying the grace to each other. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thanks for coming.